Okay, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Carrie Williams, who I work with at Rutgers University. <laughs> and um, um, yeah, she's also part of, we work together on some different uh, equine projects. And um, one interest of hers has to do with nutrient cycling on horse pastures. And we'll look forward to your talk, Carrie. Thank you, Mike, very much. Um, so yeah, just a point of clarification for those of you who don't know me that are in here. I am an equine nutritionist, so my main focus is what goes in. Um, I started at Rutgers University in 2003, and I never cared about what came out until I met Dr. Westerberg. <laughs> Dr. Westerberg really got me involved with looking at um, a, a lot of the nutrient management, and in New Jersey, we've had a lot of pushes. We've had a lot of regulations now on horse farms um, to do nutrient management plans and things. So. Um, Mike has been pivotal um, with really getting some of that going in our state um, and just because of my nutrition background I've helped a little bit so the purpose of the talk today is going to be just kind of giving you little snippets of a lot of things we've done at Rutgers to try to paint a better picture um, but really you know we have never solved the whole conundrum or the whole story or given you know all that there is to know about the nutrient cycling I'm just going to give you little snippets here and there so um, so just for a, a brief introduction, uh, you know, grazed pastures uh, typically do have a, uh, you know, a higher level of uh, nutrient cycling, especially if they're rotationally grazed than continuous grazed. And I'm going to talk a bit about that, um, you know, closer to the end of my talk, um, because it can recycle uh, the nutrients a lot faster than those pastures that are just not grazed at all. So the nutrients on the pasture land, they will enter through the animal, the waste, the waste feed, um, things like that. And then they will leave by removal of that forage from the animal, um, along with any leaching, runoff, animal waste production, removal, um, et cetera, as well. So if you take away the animal that's grazing here on the pasture, you actually take away half of the inputs and outputs. So a lot of people feel like it's just all output, um, but they're actually, they're taking in a lot uh, as well. So we have to think about it from a dietary standpoint, um, and a little bit was talked about um, previously, um, and even this morning, if you were here for uh, Jesse Weir's talk, um, horses definitely need, they need nitrogen, they need phosphorus, and they need uh, potassium. However, it's not a clean system. Obviously, everything that comes in doesn't stay in. Some of it does come out. So in horses, nitrogen is approximately 80% digestible. Um, phosphorus, only about 25%, fairly low. Um, and potassium here is at about 75% uh, digestible in the horse. And these are, you know, great averages here that have been studied for many years. So what doesn't get digested obviously comes out the back end and ends up in our pastures and in our waste stream. It has been reported, um, Dr. Ann Swinker had a student uh, in Pennsylvania that did a large study looking at um, data from farms and how much they're feeding their animals. And um, I've done small studies with small populations, uh, even in New Jersey and some competitive horses and found about the same numbers. But people are overfeeding protein to their horses on average by about one and a half times, um, or 157%. But that range is huge, anywhere from 80% of the requirements, so underfeeding it, up to about two and a half times their required amount. We're going to talk about requirements in just a little bit. And the same goes for phosphorus. On average, it's about, uh, it's almost two times their phosphorus requirements. And this does have a lot of variation uh, with the forage that they're feeding, whether it's hay or pasture. Um, so what are the sources of nitrogen and phosphorus to our environment? Uh, well, you know, you can see the, the manure bars here for both the nitrogen and the light blue and the phosphorus and the dark blue are fairly high. You know, there are a lot of other inputs for nitrogen from at atmospheric and fertilizer. Um, but, you know, in terms of manure, that's its main, uh, main thing is the phosphorus source here. Uh, but before I, I get really, uh, you know, glum on the whole uh, manure on pastures here, there are a lot of benefits. And I think that some, and I was actually talking with Dr. Swinker earlier from Penn State, it sounds like we're doing almost too much regulating and we're trying to limit the, the nutrient cycling a little bit too much because there are a lot of benefits for recycling, having the manure on the pastures because it will actually decrease the level of nitrogen um, runoff or nitrogen leaching because the organic nitrogen found in the manure 
um, is actually more available to the plants. So you're going to have an increase in crop productivity or that pasture grass by using the manure on the field versus uh, a synthetic nitrogen source, and that's what's down here. Um, you're also putting in a lot more intensive uh, uh, energy into put, spreading some of these nitrogen fertilizers. They're limited resource phosphorus fertilizer as well, um, and they can be quite expensive. Um, the soil carbon and organic matter in some of these uh, manure sources um, is also uh, nicely available, um, important for soil health and soil structure, and can eventually decrease the level of soil uh, runoff. Um, and erosion, et cetera, just by maintaining nice stands of pasture like that um, really does help overall. So yeah, we all know it can be a contaminated source as well. If at really high levels, you can have some eutrophication um, in the water, uh, build up in the soil, it can all run off, fish kills, um, and negative uh, conditions or toxic conditions in the overall water ecosystem. So, you know, that's why I think a lot of states are, you know, in some ways over-concerned by what is applied on the land, but, um, you know, we have to look at that balance. And overall farm balance has been talked about a lot here at this meeting. Um, so, how much of what goes in comes out? And that's kind of, there's a couple studies that we did at Rutgers here, uh, both Mike and I, um, that I just want to point out and talk about a little bit with phosphorus and with nitrogen. So I'm going to start off with the uh, phosphorus study we did. We used eight horses, and they were fed two different levels of phosphorus in their diet. So we had a low and a high. Um, I do want to point out that their maintenance requirement um, is 14 grams per day for this size horse that we had. They're all standard bred mares. Um, they were on the diets for an uh, adaptation period of a week. We collected for five days, then they were washed out for 14 days and switched over again. Um, but the low diet in and of itself was just a basic grass hay, nothing special forage diet with a little bit, like a half a kilogram of concentrate on it. And the only reason why we had the concentrate is because we needed something added to make the high phosphorus diet because we used pure um, sodium, uh, sodium, potassium, ugh, sodium phosphate um, added to the diet. Um, they really didn't like it a whole lot. So we needed something to help them. Uh, them eat it. So the low diet, yeah, was double the maintenance requirement, but the high diet was four and a half times uh, the maintenance requirement in these animals. And we weighed every day for that five-day collection period. Um, we didn't use nappies or anything. We did do uh, total collection. Actually, you see there's bedding here, but when, this was from another study, just a picture, we used unbedded stalls. So we uh, cleaned from unbedded stalls. So our control diet, all the numbers were the same except for in the phosphorus. Obviously that makes sense because the diets were the same other than the, uh, the sodium uh, phosphate. The control diet had about 0.36%. Uh, the added phosphorus was a little over two times that, about two and a half times in the added phosphorus diet. And this was just the percent of phosphorus in the manure that was collected. And this was a pooled sample over the five-day period um, and averaged over all the horses. We also measured water extractable phosphorus. So in that high phosphorus group, um, we had 65.8 uh, milligrams per liter of that. Um, and so our, in our added phosphorus diet, which the diet itself is 2.3 times the control, but when we're looking at water soluble phosphorus, it's actually over 3%, or er, three times that. So when we're looking at the actual water soluble version, um, you even get higher levels um, of the uh, excretion of the phosphorus. So, you know, really pretty cut and dry, simple study, um, but we did find that if you increase the level of phosphorus in the diet, you're gonna increase the output. That does make sense because it isn't very uh, digestible in horses, but the really key thing here is that water extractable phosphorus. It goes up even more so than just the total phosphorus does. So now what about protein? What about nitrogen? Um, that's, we didn't wanna do it the same study, so we did a separate study. We added a few more horses. It was the same eight horses, but we added four more. So we had 12 horses. We had two levels in the diet again. This time they did a diet adaptation of two weeks. Um, I felt like they needed a little bit more to adapt to the high protein diet especially. And then we had a washout period again, 14 days and crossed over. Same basic study design. Um, but we had a low protein diet right around the requirements um, for this size horse. The requirements were 630 grams per day. 
Um, the low protein is right around 700, so eh, 1.1 times requirement, but it's still right around there. Um, the high protein diet was done by adding seven uh, grams of soybean meal to that half a kilogram of, of pellets, sweet pea, um, to get a total of 1,042 grams per day, and that's 1.6 times, which falls right into the average that we saw with uh, the, the Pennsylvania study, the Harper study, that showed that on average people are overfeeding nitrogen or protein by about 1.5%. So that was kind of along those lines there. So what did we find? Actually, first, what did we find? Fecal organic nitrogen, urine. We actually did urine catheters. Um, and uh, blood urea and nitrogen were not significant, actually. But here are our significant levels. Controlled diet in blue, treatment in red for uh, nitrogen and ammonia. And this is all in the manure. Um, we had significant levels. And again, it was pooled over uh, all of the horses over all of the days. Um, and ammonia, much higher significantly higher in the treatment group, the high group. So what is that showing us again? Again, nothing, you know, earth shattering, you feed more, more comes out, okay? That's um, good to know. So uh, 1.6 times the recommended amount, just 1.6 times does increase uh, the level of um, excretion quite significantly. So um, we did a lot with uh, atmospheric uh, nitrogen as well, but since this is pasture recycling, I didn't do that. And I know the air quality was this morning, and there was uh, much more complex methods talked about uh, this morning. So, uh, But animal disposal is known to have a concern on a watershed um, runoff uh, and atmospheric uh, nitrogen as well. Um, phosphorus concerns, so kind of bouncing back and forth because to me this is a nice overall, you know, environmental, uh, what, what can we do with our horses' diets um, sort of thing. So, yeah, phosphorus is a concern with runoff, especially this water extractable phosphorus. Dietary modifications could be useful, especially in some of these farms that have excess runoff or, or we found to have uh, excess nutrients. Um, Mike and I have also worked with NRCS and done a CIG grant um, to try to implement a feed management program for horse farms. It's kind of similar to the uh, 592 standard of NRCS um, with horse farms versus uh, the dairy. Um, yeah, it was moderately successful, and I say moderately because you know we chose farms based on their watershed location um, and based on their willingness to work with us. However, when we said willingness to work with us, we said you have to be able to accept our recommendations for changes on your farm. And out of the 21 farms we had, we only had three that actually accepted our recommendations to change things they were doing. So I'm a horse owner myself, and I, I feel like I can, I can say this. Um, you know, horse owners really are pretty rigid in what they do. Um, so it is nice when you find someone who really wants to work and really wants to change. Um, but uh, they're, they're not very common. And I see a lot of heads shaking, so I'm sure other people have found out the same thing. But I will say in New Jersey, we are still working with NRCS, and they are developing guidelines. We have some test farms that we're actually going to implement these standards on this year. Um, and well, actually, we're not. They are, but we're helping them find the target farms um, that will work with them and try to give them financial support for decreasing their um, output, their nitrogen, their phosphorus output on um, so I kind of talked about this uh, a little bit uh, in the last slide with just overall um, farm requirements and stuff. But, but that brings me to the point of rotational grazing because I feel with horses and horse farms, um, the adaptation rate of rotational grazing, true rotational grazing using a stress lot and the proper rotating um, is fairly low on horse farms. Um, they say they rotate, but they might rotate the horses into different fields. You know, there never is a rest and regrow period. Uh, they might not utilize a stress lot, uh, that sort of thing. So um, we actually have just finished up a two-year study. My graduate student spoke in Seattle last year here about her rotational grazing after the first year, and we've done two years. Um, because a lot's been done in cattle. And yeah, great nutrient cycling. It actually increases nutrient recycling. Um, uh, the, the plant level nitrogen actually 
doubled when rotationally grazed more intensively in cattle when they're used five times versus three time rotation. Um, so really a benefit for the recycling level. Um, the first year of the rotational grazing study, and that's the only values that I can really give you now because we're still crunching numbers after the, the two years has been over, um, didn't have a whole lot of differences after the first year. And I mean, we tilled and we reseeded and we started from a totally scratch pasture. Um, and the first year, um, it didn't really see a whole lot of differences. But within the second year, I can at least show you visually what we see. Um, we started grazing in August of 2014, and by May, which are the pictures you're looking at here, of 2016, the beginning of the second season, you can clearly see, and we did horse data, we did uh, vegetative data, we did soil data, we even did water quality data. So we did an awful lot here, not water quality, I'm sorry, but water infiltration data into the soil. So you can see this is one of our, we actually have replicated continuous systems, this is one of them. Um, versus, um, again, we have replicated rotational systems. This was, a, was another one. So you can really see, at least by the vegetation, that there's a lot of differences. So, like I said, we're crunching numbers and we're seeing, but um, I think overall, uh, you know, there, there really is a lot more to do with horse farms and looking at nutrient cycling on their pastures, especially ones that do a lot of rotational grazing to see if we can um, decrease some of these things. Um, there's a lot that goes into nutrient cycling from the, the legumes in the pastures. We had primarily grass, um, cool season grass fields. We had Kentucky bluegrass, um, tall fescue orchard grass pastures. By the end of the second year, we did have a little bit of legume influx, but particularly in the continuous fields, we had a lot of weeds as well. So how does that come into play? Um, distribution of the manure, relation to the waters, etc. cetera. Um, we found that obviously in our continuous system, they did congregate. They had their loafing areas, not just by the feeder and the waters, but they had it in different areas of the pasture too. The rotational site, they seem to come back to their stress lot, defecate, drink, loaf a little, and then go back out and eat. So we actually had fairly low levels of manure on the field. Granted, that was just observational again as well and not really uh, hardcore data. And then use of fertilizer rates. We did um, a soil sample every year. I know that's a little excessive, but it was only a two year study. So um, we did every two years. Um, and we did fertilize based on the soil test, but it didn't need much, but we still did do nitrogen applications uh, in the spring of every year, along with lime as necessary. So. A lot of this work was a collaboration between Mike and myself. Um, we did a lot of these studies. Um, we, we had uh, used a lot of student labor uh, to do a lot of these studies. This was actually this year we did another bedding study, which is why you see bedding in the stalls. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of support too from our Equine Science Center and the New Jersey Department of Agriculture uh, for a lot of these things. So thank you very much. Sure. Questions for Dr. Williams? Yes. Yeah, and uh, you may have said that in the, the Barron study with the cow, it was, you doubled the nitrogen levels in what, the soil, the plant tissue? Soil. soil. Yeah, soil. Sorry. Yeah, I, I skimmed through a lot of that stuff, uh, so I apologize. Yeah. Kevin, um, you showed the range of um, people over the Mm -hmm. I was trying to figure out which groups were at which end of that. I, I think great race horse and school was speaking negative. Yeah. And I, I couldn't quite predict the use of other female. So I'm going to answer from the work I've done, and then I'm going to turn it over to Ann Swinker. Oh, yeah, I will. He asked about, so the, the Harper study, and um, I'm going to have Ann jump in here and help me out with because that was uh, part of her, one of her student studies. Um, but he just asked, what different populations of horse owners underfed versus overfed? Um, and I can address from the standpoint that some of the producers that I've sampled were the high performance horses. And all of the high performance horses, meaning the jumpers, the eventers, the race horses, were over in everything. They were over in their minerals from the calcium, magnesium, the phosphorus. Stables, the breeders, yep. the backyard folks. The they were at the low end. Yeah, and your study encompassed everybody, right? You yeah. just did a random survey of everything? Yes, I'm going to do the same thing she did in like several studies. Good. So come back in two talks and, <laughs> and 
and I'll present all that stuff. I just yeah. have another question that I noticed, like all those farms that we tell, especially like your, your new, you know, your precision feeding one, did you ever go back to them after you were saying this manure is so bad, so bad, that now these people are exporting it when you go to their places now, the soil quality is so bad because there's no organic matter in the hay fields or some of the pastures because we've been teaching them So the, the, the farms that we worked with, again, we had two watersheds. We had 10 on one watershed, 11 at another one in South Jersey and North Jersey. Uh, the, the producers on the farms that would work with us, believe it or not, and this was, how long ago was this? My four years ago, four, years, five, four or five years. years ago, we're still working with today. Like they are really, really soaking up all the information we give them. They're working with NRCS, they're working with us. You know, they always ask us lots of questions about how to do X, Y, and Z. The ones that didn't want to listen to us and didn't want to take anything we said, we haven't heard from again. And you know, so we haven't been onto their farms to see like, has it gotten even worse? Because we didn't foster a very good working relationship. And I mean, I was the nutritionist on the panel. I did, uh, you know, we spent hours on each farm doing total dietary analysis of all of the horses. We body condition scored every horse on every farm down from two horses to 75 horses. Uh, you know, so it, it was it was a lot of time and effort, and we were very polite going on the farms and talking to the people and educating them about why it might be bad to have a body condition score eight horse that was getting fed ten different supplements and they all had phosphorus in it. You know that sort of thing. So we really tried to provide as much education as possible, and it can only go as far as they want it to go. <laughs> Our people are just afraid. Of We had, we didn't have that par that problem with the people who were working with us. We had the problem of getting people to work with us because they saw that we were trying to develop standards with NRCS and we had some farms that were like, I want no part of that because I don't want to have any part with making any res regulations. So, um, but we still, we had our, our cap at, you know, we had to limit the number of farms obviously because, you know, I was the only one who went out and did the nutritional consults and we did, you know, pre and post uh, consults and things as well. So it was, it was quite time consuming, but it was a very good learning experience. <laughs> Anything else?